Well, good morning. Good morning. And this morning I was looking out the window of our study across the street and I saw the neighbor's trees turning color. And I thought, my goodness, we're finally getting into fall. And so, you know, I'm ready for this season. Speaking of seasons, we're at a time in our church where the seasons are changing. And I'm looking forward to October 18th when our new ministerial candidate will be here to speak to us. So I'm forbidden to give you his real name. So I've invented one. It's Reverly, I mean, it, sorry. It's uh, Reverend Gaberly Profundus. But I'll just give you a hint. It's another German name. So welcome everybody. We are here to worship God and be with one another. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Good morning. Oh, I do look forward to the day when we can get up and wander around again. But now we must all stay in our places with bright, sunshiny faces, except you can't even really see that because we've all got masks on. If it had not been God who was on our side, If it had not been God who was on our side, our 
Are any among us suffering? Are any among us cheerful? Are any among us sick? Our help is in our God. Call upon God, creator and rescuer. God is on our side. Let's pray. Lord of the universe and leader of your people, give wisdom to all those who exercise authority. Teach them to put the good of the many before the greed of the few. Help them to love truth and to hate falsehood and corruption. And above all, urge them to remember that the one who would be greatest must learn to be the servant of all. Grant that we may choose our leaders wisely. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth. We are entering into our annual season of generosity. Uh, thinking about what we want to give the church in time, talent, money for next year as we welcome a new minister, I hope. And so from time to time we are having guest speakers and as soon as Dolores that's fumbling around with her glasses and mask, she's going to talk to us a little bit. Come on up, Dolores. Good morning. It's good to see you all. The stewardship ministry has asked me to talk about the Good Samaritan Club. And I know most of you know that we do have a Good Samaritan ministry here in our church. And what we do is we try to help the people that live in the Union School District. And they must live in the Union School District. We help with rent, water, food, uh, uh, the water and electricity. We do have a limit on to how we can help them. So if a person comes in and says, I need $800 for my rent, we can't do that. We encourage them to contact other agencies and we can give a certain amount. In order for us to see them and to serve them, they either walk into the office or they call and Connie makes an appointment. And it's usually on a Wednesday. Sometimes it changes, but usually on a Wednesday. And when they come in, we give them a card that just has very basic information on their name, where they live, uh, are you married, do you have a job, are you looking for a job, do you have children, and then just talk to them for a few minutes just to see why maybe they're in the circumstances they are. Why are they behind on their rent bill? Why are they behind on their water bill. So we just get a chance to meet them a little bit. After we talk to them, I make a decision as to whether or not we can help them. Connie is always there to help me. I don't know what I do without Connie, but I don't know what any of us would do without Connie. So, you know, anyway. Uh, and we never give them the money. Never. We will find out who their landlord is. We make sure that if the amount that we can give to the electric company will stop them, stop it from being uh, turned off, then we will send the electric company a check. Or they have to go over here and pay their water bill. It's for food, we give them a voucher and they can go up to Frank's. And another thing I want to tell you is we are not in the church budget. So we live strictly on the contributions that comes from the church and we've been so fortunate uh, we it's just amazing how fortunate we have been to ha have enough money just to keep us going and at times it gets a little low we're kind of getting that place right now but you know God works wonders and um, I feel confident that we will have enough to carry on because winter is coming and that's when it really gets hard for people with electricity and with rent, a lot of them don't have jobs now. Most of them are looking for jobs, 
But unfortunately, even if they get a job, it just really doesn't go. If you work at McDonald's and you get paid nine dollars an hour, it doesn't pay your, your bill. So please, if you feel in your heart that you can help us, please give us a little bit of money. Thank you much. The Hebrew scripture reading is from Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. The whole Israelite community broke camp and set out from the Sin Desert to continue their journey as the Lord commanded. They set up their camp, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people argued with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why are you arguing with me? Why are you testing the Lord? But the people were very thirsty for water there, and they complained to Moses, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us, our children and our livestock, with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What should I do with these people? They are getting ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the Israel's uh, elders with you. Take in your hand the shepherd's rod that you use to strike the Nile River and go. I'll be standing there in front of you on the rock of Horeb. Hit the rock. Water will come out of it, and the people will be able to drink. Moses did so while Israel's elders watched. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites argued with and tested the Lord, asking, Is the Lord really with us or not? The epistles reading is from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Therefore, is there any encouragement in Christ? any comfort in love, any sharing of the Spirit, any sympathy. Complete my joy by thinking the same way, having the same love, being united, and agreeing with each other. Don't do anything for selfish purposes, but with humility think in others as better than yourselves. Instead of each person watching out for their own good, Watch out for what is better for others. Adopt the attitude that was in Jesus Christ. Though he was in the form of God, he did not consider being equal with God something to exploit. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave and by becoming like human beings. When he found himself in the form of a human, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God highly honored him and gave him a name above all names, so that at the name of Jesus, everyone in heaven, on earth, and under the earth might bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Carry out your salvation, Therefore, my beloved ones, just as you always obey me, not just when I am present, but now even more when I am away, carry out your own salvation with fear and trembling. God is the one who enables you both to want and to actually live out his good purposes. Our responsive reading is Psalms 24, 3 through 7, 9 through 10. Who can ascend the Lord's mountain? Who can stand in his holy sanctuary? That kind of person receives blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God who saves.
This morning's Gospel reading is from Matthew. We've been, for the most part, following the lectionary this year, the prescribed set of readings that most Protestant churches and the Catholic Church follow. And today the reading is from chapter 21. It's verses 23 to 32. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and elders of the people came to him as he was teaching. They asked, what kind of authority do you have for doing these things? Who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I have a question for you. If you tell me the answer, I'll tell you what kind of authority I have to do these things. Where did John get his authority to baptize? Did he get it from heaven? or from humans. They argued among themselves, if we say from heaven, he'll say to us, then why didn't you believe him? 
But he can't say, we can't say from humans because we're afraid of the crowds since everyone thinks that John was a prophet. Then they replied, we don't know. Jesus also said to them, neither will I tell you what kind of authority I have to do these things. The word of God for the people of God. Well, my mom told me years ago if I wanted to keep friendships, never talk about politics or religion. So this morning I'm going to talk about politics and religion. <laughs> well, as you know, we are in the throes of a presidential election year, probably like any, unlike any other that at least is in our memories. We have more than the usual complications going on to Powell things up. First of all, we have the novel coronavirus, and that makes it difficult for people to safely get to polling places. And then we have the mess up with the U.S. Postal Service and the question of whether or not ballots can be safely delivered on time and counted. There is a fear of some people that mail-in ballots are going to be very susceptible to fraudulent um, voting, even though the statistical evidence shows that that's a very remote possibility. Well, I don't know about you. I'm fed up with a whole mess. Are you? Yeah, I thought so. Well, hey, for entertainment this week, we have the first of the presidential debates. So is this going to be real? Is this going to be a real exchange of ideas and plans? Or is it going to turn into a circus act? I'd like to see a real debate, but I'm skeptical. All of this is in the background of some emergent questions that are coming out right now. Presidential authority. Who holds the final authority? Now, there are some in government who really believe in minority power. That is, only the special elite should be able to choose our highest leaders. Others, including the Democrats, really believe in the idea of government of the people, by the people, and for the people, and they want to abolish the Electoral College because they feel it's not fair. But fortunately, our Founding Fathers gave some thought to this. So we have some guidelines. In fact, they were dealing with the very same kinds of issues at the founding of our Republic. And after the Constitution was voted on and accepted, a question was put to Benjamin Franklin. Well, what do we have? A Republic or a monarchy? He said, a republic, if we can keep it. Now, Alexander Hamilton and the Federalists wanted to have a very strong executive branch, while others felt that it was really important for everybody to be involved in those decisions and that there should be a balance of powers. The constitutional writers actually put down some specific guidelines for us. First of all, in the Declaration of Independence, we are told that power is granted by the consent of the governed. That's us. We consent to be governed. And by whom? And second, the Constitution guarantees every citizen the right to vote, period. So ultimately, the way it's laid out in our Constitution, we choose who will lead our nation. The authority of the branches is specified in the Constitution. In Article 1, Section 1, it says, all legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and House of Representatives. 
Section 7 says, to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers which have been enumerated, and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof. And Article 2, Section 1 says, the executive power shall be vested in a President of the United States of America. Well, this is about civil authority. But what about ecclesiastical authority? That is, churchly authority. Well, in the Gospel reading this morning, we certainly had an example of how politics meets religion. You see, the chief priests and the elders who confronted Jesus had religious authority. The Jewish kings ruled, on the other hand, the secular rule, so to speak. The Jewish kings, like Herod, ruled, but their powers were delegated by the Roman Empire. Now, the political religious leaders at the time walked a very fine line. You see, with separation of church and state, our political parties are political parties, period. But in that day, politics and religion was all mixed together because Israel had been ruled by kings appointed by God. In other words, it was a theocracy, not a democracy. Now, these religious leaders that confronted Jesus perceived him as a threat to their power. Threat to their power. Doesn't that sound a little bit like today? So as the delegation of priests and elders approached Jesus, they were upset because Jesus had already caused quite a ruckus. They had crowds following him. Some were proclaiming him to be the Messiah, and the Messiah was supposed to become the king, and that might upset the Romans. So they were fearful of their own power. And so they approached him and said, what authority do you have for doing these things? Who gave you that authority? Jesus was always so clever with these questions, because once again he laid a counter trap. If you tell me who gave John the Baptist the authority to do what he did, I'll tell you who gave me the authority. In other words, he stonewalled them. Because as they thought about it, no matter what they answered, it was going to get them in trouble. With God or with the people. So they answered, we don't know. That sounds like a lot of politicians today, isn't it? We don't know. Well, then Jesus said, neither will I tell you what kind of authority I have to do these things. And he walked away. Now, if he had answered, God gave me the power, that would be heresy. And if he said that the people gave him authority, he would be turned over to the Romans for sedition. So neither answer he gave would be acceptable. So you won't tell me, I won't tell you. Now here comes the important part of this. What are the implications for us? First of all, let us remember that power is derived from the consent of the governed. That is not only true in the secular state, it's true in the church as well. So no matter if I tell you, God has given me the authority to say these things to you, it will not be true. I do feel like God has called me into ministry and to speak and interpret God's word. But he didn't give me any special authority. He says, you see, in the United Church of Christ, the congregation, you, 
and its leaders. You have ecclesial authority. You have the power in the church. So by calling me, you have affirmed my calling and given me spiritual authority. But that can be taken away. The United Church of Christ has authorized me as a minister. If I get out of line, that can be taken away too. True, some traditions, Roman Catholics, Episcopalians, Lutherans, Methodists, others, are still ruled hierarchically, starting in Catholicism from the Pope on down to the Cardinals and the Archbishops and the Bishops and the Priests. But even then, if the people don't agree, then they have no power. They have no authority. And fortunately for us, the days of the Inquisition are over. Now, power has its limitations. There are certain boundaries I may not cross. I know that I have a love affair going with Honey Bunny parked out in the lot today. But if I were to try to do anything like that with any of you, I would be in violation of ministerial code of ethics. And I would be in trouble. I'm enjoined to use whatever power I have for the benefit of you, of all of you, without favorites. I'm not given the power to manipulate this church or any other church on my own behalf. And believe me, there are some horror stories out there about pastors who have done just that. I have to mind my own P's and Q's. So the question I have is do we impose the same obligations over our heads of state? And not just the president, but the governors and the mayors and everybody down the line. You know, I find it interesting how the Bible, which was written in ancient times, once again is so relevant to our time, to now. Now my hope is that this will help guide you as you go to the polls in a, about a, six weeks. Remember, you have the power. I also hope that it will guide you when prayerfully you choose your next pastor. Meanwhile, here's what we should do. Pray for guidance and listen to the Holy Spirit. God knows we need help. Amen. I'm wobbling today. I can't walk a straight line. There was a crooked pastor, but never mind. So, as we come to prayer, I especially want to call your attention to Marvis Templer and Bruce. Marvis is back home from the hospital. We had blood clots in her legs and her lungs, and those are being dissolved. She had uh, fluid on her chest, and that's being reduced. So she's doing better day by day, but she really wants our prayers. And of course, we want to keep Bernice Bell and Wayne in our prayers as they struggle with end of life issues. Who else should we especially be praying for this morning? Then I invite you to be with me in a spirit of prayer. Oh Lord God, creator of the universe. All that exists is yours. You have made us. You have made us the sheep of your pasture. You have given us the gift of sentience so that we know who we are. And we 
are able to discern differences between each other. And yet, even though our opinions about politics and other issues may differ, you, O oh God, have final authority in our lives. And so we turn to our scriptures and use them as a guide, as a lamp for our path, as a light for our feet. And we thank you that you have given us both freedom to choose, and yet you have set before us the ways of life and death. Help us to choose life, that we may live long in this world that you have given us, and to follow Jesus along the narrow way that leads to eternal life. Open our hearts to love others, even those with whom we may disagree. Open our minds to think clearly, rationally, critically. Open our spiritual ears that we may hear what you have to say to us in this time and place. We pray for the healing of our nation with all of its divisions and its violence and threats of more violence. We pray for our world that lives in constant turmoil. We pray for those who are on the streets and have no home because they've lost their jobs or people who can't pay the electricity or have to choose between buying medication and buying food. We pray for those in our own congregation, especially this morning, Marvis Templer and Bruce and Wayne and Bernice Bell. We pray for the leaders of our congregation, Jane and the council and everyone else, that they may be guided through this time of change by your Holy Spirit. May we all walk in the pathways of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. What do I have to give, said the little drummer boy, as poor as I am. All I really have to give is my heart, my hands, my feet, my mouth. And inasmuch as we have been blessed with comfort, shelter, and food, we have the opportunity to give so that others may also live, as with the Good Samaritan Club that Dolores talked about this morning. We have the opportunity to give to the work of our church, to sustain it in this time of COVID-19 crisis, so that we may have a clear, strong ministry for the future. And so I give thanks to you that you are a generous people. And now we offer ourselves our gifts, our lives, to the Lord. Let us pray together. Merciful God, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to show us a different way to live, the way of deep humility and obedience. You've called us to love one another and to work together with one heart and mind. 
Give us the courage to follow faithfully with actions that bear witness to the words we speak and worship that overflows into our daily tasks and relationships so that our lives and our offerings will bring glory and honor to you, our Redeemer and our Lord. On the back of your lime green sheets, some announcements. I'd especially like to call attention to the fact that next week we're celebrating Worldwide Communion Sunday. That means we join in solidarity with Christians all over the world to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And we, the Council, and especially thanks to Alicia, have figured out a safe way for you to receive communion. And then we've got a very important date coming up on October 11th. This is the Crop Walk. And that's on Sunday, beginning at 1 p.m. here at Zion. You can walk at home. There's a sign-up sheet down below on the lower commons. And then there's a rockathon at Frick's Market from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Saturday, October 3rd. Now, Norman tells me there's a little problem. We have walkers, but we don't have rockers. And I said, do you want me to rock or walk? You know, I'd rather rock. I could just sit there and talk to people. But you want to say a little bit more, Norma, about crop walk? Thank you. You know, it's amazing where Norma shows up. Um, this Saturday we had a Zoom business meeting of our Eastern Association of the Missouri Mid-South Conference of the United Church of Christ, followed by a um, meeting of the whole conference itself and the installation of our new Associate Conference Minister, Damian Lake. And there were Norma, and Armin, and she finally figured out how to get her picture on there. <laughs> she had a few things to say that were worthwhile. And one of the participants wondered if Armin's vote was invalidated because he wasn't wearing a tie. <laughs> I told them I gave him a special dispensation. <laughs> so Alicia was there, I was there, Norman and Armin as our church delegates, and thank you all very much for participating. Any other announcements? You want to go home? If you say yes, I'm going to keep you longer.
probably wonder what I'm doing. I'm doing this for the benefit of Alicia, who says it's really hard sometimes to follow me where I'm going with the camera, so I just thought I'd give you a little practice. And now, may the Lord, who is our shepherd, bless us. May God lead us to still waters and let us take repose in green pastures. May God anoint us with the oil of the Spirit and fill our cups so they are overflowing. And may God's mercy and justice follow us all the days of our life. Go. We are blessed. Be a blessing to others. Amen. Come down and sit.